During this time when many of us are not able to be as connected physically, one of the things that we have begun here in worship is inviting people to retell a Bible story. Uh, and so this morning we will begin by turning to our video which comes to us from the Wing family as we hear this story to begin our worship. Go ahead. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name was Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she became sick and died. So her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lida was near Joppa, so when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lida, they sent two men to get him and urged him, please come at once. Peter went with them, and then he arrived. He was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood around him, crying and showing them the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Peter sent all of them out of the room. Then they got down on his knees and prayed. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes and it seemed Peter, she sat up. He took her by the head and helped her to her feet. Then she called for the believers, especially the widows, and presented to them alive. This became known all over Joppa and people believed the Lord. Peter stayed with a, in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon. Very good, thank you. You're welcome. Good morning, my name is Sarah Verasco and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. And on behalf of all of the worship leaders, including our AV team this morning, I wanna welcome you to this time of connecting in spirit and remembering what it's like to be a community that practices love and grace. Regardless of where you're joining us from, I'm convinced that it is good to be together. And I hope that your ability to see faces or phone numbers and to hear familiar voices uh, brings you some comfort today. We're receiving more and more news of people whose families are directly affected by the pandemic and that are ill with uh, the COVID virus. And so I just want to acknowledge that and acknowledge that there is um, a lot of pain and suffering and loss right here in Longmont and in the communities beyond. And I know many of you are holding that close, so we hold it together as a community, even as we hold the promise um, that our God is with us still. And as you settle into wherever you are, allow yourself to release what you've been holding, to just let it go for a moment. Allow yourself to be supported by either the floor that you're standing on or the chair or seat that is holding you. Allow yourself to breathe with ease and to acknowledge the gift of breath, to acknowledge the gift of your body. And in this moment of ease and of release, I want you to hear these words, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here and you are wanted and you are valued. And as a community, we've also taken, um, taken up a new tradition a new practice of lighting the way. And this morning, as you light your candles for whatever is, um, whatever is before you and wherever you see a need or an expression of light in the world, 
Uh, we're going to light the way a little bit differently. We're going to light it with song. And Jenny and Tim have presented this song for us, and it is an offering to you to light your way. No, when I'm broken, when I'm broken, I'm in need, and I'm in need. Feel that ocean, feel that ocean, swallowing me, and swallowing me. Head is hanging, head is hanging, so silently. to the sea. And may God's light continue to shine on you. And this morning we're going to introduce another practice, uh, a loving kindness practice. And this is intended to, um, to rest upon you and to be at work in you in the same spirit of that song, a lightness. Let there be lightness as we engage in this practice that over time, will reveal to you um, an expansive mercy that can be at work. And sometimes when we think about loving kindness, the word forgiveness doesn't always come easily, but it can. And so we're going to engage in this practice. The words are going to be on your screen. And I'm going to invite you to read along with me and then to pause for a few moments in between each section. So let's enter into this trusting that the light of God is shining on us. For any harm I may have caused others, knowingly or unknowingly, through my thoughts, words, and actions, I ask their forgiveness. For any harm others have caused me, knowingly or unknowingly, through their thoughts, words, and actions, I forgive them as best I am able. For any harm I may have caused myself, knowingly and unknowingly, through my thoughts, words, and actions. I forgive myself as best I am able.
Friends, I hope you'll print that out and allow that to be a regular practice in your life. Because as you, perhaps as you joined in today, and as you join in in the future in saying and offering these words, someone or something might come to mind. And I know that God's Spirit works really gently on those who are committed to not harming. And will say, you know, I just, just take a look at this. And when you're invited to take a look at one of those things that maybe you were invited to do this morning, maybe something came to you this morning, hold it gently, like last week's potato chip. Just hold it gently and see what the Spirit will do with you. Accept it as a gift. And this morning's scripture, I think, is a gift as well. In our story, we're going to be traveling to the region of Tyre and Sidon. These were prosperous port cities, so think of it as the ancient version of San Francisco's Fisherman's Wharf. Allow yourself to travel that distance where commerce and trading were taking place and where settled and seasonal communities intermingled. In other parts of scripture, we hear that early in Jesus' ministry, people from this region were among the crowds that heard about him and came out to hear him and to be healed by him. And today we hear a specific story about a time when Jesus went to that region and was sought out by a woman who was not of Israelite descent. So from a tradition standpoint, she was an outsider. She would have been one of those seasonal people, perhaps. If you ever lived in a tourist town, you know what I'm talking about. And what unfolds is an exchange that demonstrates what mercy can sound like in a moment of desperation. And the exchange also demonstrates the expansive nature of God's mercy. So let's listen now to this story from the community we know as Matthew, chapter 16. No, chapter 15. So Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he didn't answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. Seems as though she knew Jesus or knew of him. Maybe she was one of those early followers that went out to see what was going on who this new teacher was in town. And she comes onto the scene quite suddenly and shouting, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David, my daughter is tormented by a demon. She uses a title of respect. 
Lord meaning master or teacher. And she acknowledges his lineage as a son of David. And he did not respond at all. But the disciples somehow thought they were talking to them too. And then she came and knelt before him, even more humbly and more respectful, and said, Lord, help me. And as strange as it is to hear these words come out of Jesus' mouth, I want you to hear them and stick with them. It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Yes, he did. As an outsider, she was a dog. And the food, the bread of life, that is Jesus himself, was not sent for her. And it's worth pointing out that this story comes in between the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000, where bread was given freely and there was so much left over. Why would he not offer her a morsel or a loaf? And here's where it changes. Because I guess from a cultural perspective, even though I hate to think of Jesus uttering those words from a cultural perspective, that first part could even be a little predictable. But here's where it changes. She says, yes. Yes, Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And he says, woman, great is your faith. I go back and forth with this story between thinking it was an organic moment where Jesus was learning as he goes, where grace was at work within him, and all of a sudden he's like, whoa, she's right. It's bigger than even I thought. And I like that. I like that interpretation of it. And then sometimes I think it was a staged moment. You know, like one of those skits you do on retreat or at youth group a skit that's used as a valuable teaching moment where the powerful one is using power in a new way and taking what was ordinary and making it extraordinary or taking what was common and then opening it up in a brand new way. Either way, I find it to be helpful and important. I mean, what about you? How do you see it? And I think as we look at this, it's worth noting what is absent. What is absent in both people, Jesus and the woman, is defensiveness. They're not arguing. What's absent also is power hoarding. It's not like this is the way it is. End of conversation. Punctuation ends the sentence. No. And what's also absent is only one right way. This is expansion in process. Now, the ones who are really having trouble with Jesus and the ones who might have been witnessing this little skit or this organic exchange are the scribes and the Pharisees. Because right before this story, they're having a lot of trouble with Jesus. They've been testing him and they're asking him, you know, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? And in this instance, they're saying they don't wash their hands before they eat. But when it comes to Jesus, his relationship with God and his understanding of the scriptures is different. How could it not be? He's certainly influenced from his own position, just like we all are. And he's not 
an outsider necessarily. He is an insider by birth. But he doesn't have the full cultural power that are granted to the scribes and the Pharisees. See, by their title, they're given a lot of power. They're the ones that are to tell us what their traditional practices and beliefs are. But it's Jesus' own position as someone who is an insider but on the fringes that allows him to see things differently. If we take this to an extreme and over an extended period of time, practices and beliefs that are presented as true and even God-given become accepted as, as the way things are. Taken to an extreme and over an extended period of time, the beliefs and practices are expected to be held in common. And in fact, depending upon how long they are held in common, they even stop being articulated. You're just supposed to know. If you've ever worked with the refugee population, it's a great way to learn what is held in common and practiced by all. This kind of held in common presumption is the basis of a supremacy culture or of a superior culture where cultural norms and systems of law are presented in practices and beliefs that are fiercely defended, that are enforced with great power, and that are upheld as the right way, to which many then and now are saying, no, not so fast. The woman said, yes, but I acknowledge your teaching, but And rather than outsiders or culturally less powerful people being expected to learn and follow the beliefs and practices if they want to be included, it's worth exploring a few questions. Whether you are a founder or the last one in the room, getting at the unspoken beliefs and practices of a group can be very helpful. These are the things that need to be unearthed. Questions like, what is valued? So look at that story, what was valued? First it was the tradition. I have come for these people. And then it was the woman. Who was served? I think in that instance, all of them are served. But most importantly, God is served. Because God's mercy always expands beyond our understanding. Does it sound like God to you to say, Sorry, I didn't come for you. I don't think so. Who was followed? That's a tougher one. Because culturally, the scribes and the Pharisees are the ones that are obeyed, perhaps. But the one that is followed is the one that is speaking and healing the ills that are created by this rigid and these rigid teachings. And how were decisions made? You know, Jesus didn't pause the conversation and confer with his disciples. He didn't go off and pray. Wow. It just happened in that moment. These are valuable questions for a church council, for a community nonprofit, for a country. 
They're valuable questions even just for a person. In this moment, what is valued? And where will I align? Who is served? Who is followed? How are decisions made? Remember, the outsider in today's story is the woman and Jesus. Jesus is not the center of power in the ancient world or in this world, but Jesus is the center of power in God's world. And that dichotomy exists throughout Scripture. I'm not a big fan of the dichotomy, but I think it's helpful to think about it, to think about who is served, Which world is served? So whether it's religious extremism or systemic racism, or the very practical and very timely question about Thanksgiving in a time of pandemic, You know, that was a big leap, I know. I'm going to give you time to catch up. But how are you going to be making decisions around a season and a ritual and a practice and a tradition of giving thanks? I think it's safe to say that most people are going to have to go with a second or a third or a fourth choice this year. So how do we make that into our top choice and be at peace with that? I'm very familiar with my inner scribe and Pharisee. And I hope that you are becoming aware of that too. It's the part of you that's going to pout all the way to Thanksgiving if you let it. Because it's not going to be the people around the table that you want and the dishes that you want and the food that you might want. Because if it's not on the table, it's not Thanksgiving. (laughs) But I think we're being asked to practice mercy with ourselves, with those who we consider to be family, and with those who are in our community. And really find meaning in the moment. This is the year to take a look at what giving thanks really means. This is the year to take a moment to ask what would be meaningful. So as a church community, we have a lot of options. We have provided the option to meet on Zoom, in groups, in supper groups. We have asked for food bags to be collected so that others may eat. But I'm guessing you have other things in mind, too, and I hope you do. Because this is the year where tradition is right before us, and we're invited to be merciful, and to perhaps create a new one that would reflect the expansive nature of God's love that is intended to feed us all, where even a crumb can satisfy so deeply. If your love and your tradition is not expanding, it might be getting weaker. Let's remember where God is. 
where Jesus is and where the power is. It's shared. Draw the circle wide, draw it wider still. Let this be our song, no one stands alone, standing side by side. Draw the circle wide. Got the still point of the circle, Round whom all creation turns Nothing lost but held forever In God's gracious arms Draw the circle wide Draw it wider still Let this be our song No one stands alone Standing side by side, draw the circle wide. Let our hearts touch far horizons, so encompass great and small. Let our loving know no borders, faithful to God's call. Draw the circle wide, draw it wider still. Let this be our song, no one stands alone, standing side by side. Draw the circle wide. Let the dreams we dream be larger, than we've ever dreamed before. Let the dream of Christ be in us, open every door. Draw the circle wide, draw it wider still. Let this be our song, no one stands alone, standing side by side, draw the circle wide. We began this uh, month of gratitude with All Saints Day, where we honored and remembered those who have walked before us and those who still shine their light on us. And so it's in that spirit that I invite you to join with me in prayer, praying this prayer of the saints. God of all times and places, may we see the holiness that surrounds us. We put our trust in you and ask for the strength to continue and expand the good work begun by those who came before. Give us bread for the world. Forgive our mistakes and help us forgive them too. When we face temptation or trial, grant us your presence and the courage, wisdom, and grace to follow your way. Amen. This has been, as we are seeing uh, the increase in COVID rates, and as Reverend Sarah mentioned at the beginning, the increasing impacts in our own community, uh, not to mention the ongoing challenges of life 
and uh, the joys, but also the sicknesses and the hardships that happen uh, to all of us. And I know that at these times it can feel heavy. But I also know that we do continue to be the light for the world. And so if you are in a place where you are wondering what you can do in this time, either what you can do because you are feeling the impact for yourself or what you can do because the need might feel so great, I invite you to turn to some words that are often inspirational for me, and they come from an author uh, by the name of Marion Rademacher. And she said, as we work to create light for others, we naturally light our own way. The practice of generosity is something that we do uh, because it helps all of us. It helps us know that we are in this together. And so when we do it, we build a strength of community. I hope that you are finding ways that are meaningful for you to give in this time in whatever way that you are able. And if you choose to give to this community, uh, if you are able to give financially to this community at this time, know that we treasure those gifts and we are working hard to put them to use in ways that are uplifting to all. You can find a link for giving in your chat window. Uh, you can also connect with the office if you're looking for uh, further instructions for electronic giving or an address to mail uh, checks to. We welcome those gifts and we welcome your gifts of time and talent as well. So if there's a need arising in the community that you see that you would like to give to, please don't hesitate to contact Reverend Sarah or myself or one of our uh, other leaders in the church. Good morning. It's good to be with you. My name is Lori Moore. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I serve on your council. I'm here to give you the announcements for today. We're holding this year's holiday food bag collections earlier this year to assure that we can provide items for Thanksgiving and Christmas. Instead of the past blue bags, please use a paper or plastic shopping bag. Please note that donations should be brought to the church parking lot on Sunday, November 15th or 22nd from noon to 1 p.m. For those of you who want to participate but are not shopping during this pandem pandemic time, you may bring cash or checks made out to the Hour Center to drop off on Sundays, November 15th and 22nd from 12 to 1 p.m. in the church parking lot. Many thanks from the UCC Mission Ministry. Join our church family for a virtual Thanksgiving dinner on Thursday, November 26th at 4 p.m. and or Friday, November 27th at 6 p.m. Each dinner will be about 90 minutes long as a lot of talking goes on. Like Sunday after worship fellowship time, you will be put into a breakout room of six to eight people, your dinner partners. Have your Thanksgiving dinner ready to eat when you zoom in. Enjoy fellowship and conversation. Links to sign up can be found on our Mission Possible and Happenings newsletters. Can't get signed up online? Call the office. If you leave a message, please provide your name, which day you plan to join in, and how many people will be participating with you. And last announcement. If you'd like to participate in this year's Christmas pageant, breaking news from Bethlehem, please let Reverend Amelia know by November 23rd. For more information, please see happenings or contact Reverend Amelia. Thank you.
there's a spirit in the air telling Christians everywhere praise the love that Christ revealed living working in our world lose your shyness find your tongue tell the world what God has done God in Christ has come to stay live tomorrow's life today still the spirit gives us light seeing wrong and setting right God in Christ has come to stay live tomorrow's life today Friends, go now to live lives of humility that you may always find opportunity to learn new things in the Spirit. But in that, also live lives of courage that you may speak the truth as you are learning it and be willing to share God's ever-expanding love with others. As you do these things, know that the light of God surrounds you. The love of God enfolds you. The power of God protects you. The presence of God watches over you, and wherever you are, God is. Amen.